10 years because of the battle between Lucent and nuclear solutions. So you can always um, go to the website. In fact, did I put it down here? It's nuclearsolutions.com. I think it's on the next slide, perhaps. And of course, the patent information is also on the web. You can now go to the um, USPTO.gov and get all these patents, too. So you can take a look at the profound um, invention that he's made. And let me point out again my big emphasis here, 2004 IEEE Spectrum, just about a month ago. I um, don't have the exact month. They had a whole article in nuclear batteries. I think it was last month in, in August. <clears throat> so I'm fascinated to see the experts come, uh, you know, uh, once again, rediscovering, saying, oh, yes, for the first time we've discovered this. And then, of course, I know and you know that our experts knew of that 10 years ago. And, and, of course, you have to then remind them. I'm going to start sending Paul Brown articles to these guys you know, so they know about it. And actually, while I'm on the topic, this photoremediation of nuclear waste is probably the most best-kept secret in the country. Um, nobody, I don't know if you know, but nuclear waste storage in Yucca Mountain is never going to happen. <laughs> Not as long as there's a single person in Nevada to stop it, you know. And there's plenty of courts that have already issued all kinds of wonderful rulings to stop it for various reasons. But the strange thing is the remediation of nuclear waste has just been not only invented by Paul Brown over 10 years ago, but reinvented in the Journal of Physics D, and I'm citing this quote right at the bottom here, laser-driven phototransmutation. And of course, they're talking about this as if it's a brand new experience, citing giant dipole resonance just like Paul did, and they're using a laser. See, lasers have gotten really powerful now, and, and you can produce lasers that have um, not only gigawatts, not only terawatts, but petawatts. I mean, this is inconceivable. It's 10 to the 20th, actually. We're talking about um, uh, 10,000 petawatts, which is 10 to the 20th watts, for only about a femtosecond or a picosecond. So what that does to the radioactive waste, in this case, it's iodine-129, which normally has a half-life of 15 million years. <laughs> Instead, after the one-shot treatment, there's um, 10 million, uh, it's, it's a very large number from a one-shot treatment, just as an experiment. Yep, it was 3 million nuclei were transmuted to a half-life of, guess what, 25 minutes. <laughs> Can you live with that? <laughs> and the nice thing is, and I'm sorry I don't have a, a slide of it, but this picture is beautiful because it shows you the encapsulation of the radioactive waste, which is certainly beautiful and we all want that, and then they put it in front of the gamma rays and the gamma rays go right through it. So you've got the safety of the encapsulation and then you run it by, just like all your foods being irradiated today, hey, hello, let's radiate the waste too, <laughs> you know? And it's just a little bit higher frequency, that's all. So, um, so this is exactly where we're headed and I'm doing this and on Capitol Hill as best I can too. Whenever I get a chance and get an appointment with those staffers or advisors to, um, to senators, I've been to Kerry's office twice, for example, um, and I'm gonna send this guy the Paul Brown article. So he knows that lots of other radioisotopes also can be transmuted and, like the government says, <clears throat> they think you have to separate the waste into little pockets of, you know, apples and oranges and grapefruits and bananas and stuff before you treat them because they call it accelerated transmutation, transmutation of waste, ATW. Well, this process that we're talking about here is down in the 6 MeV range, actually 6 to 10, which is so low it doesn't activate the waste at all. You never produce more active radioactive stuff than you start with. But the ATW government approach does, and that's the problem. So I know an insider at DOE, and we're doing the best we can to get him to grab the report. Oh, by the way, the DOE just verified everything I just said. They did. But as a, as a standard policy, this is what happens in the East Coast. So you guys in the West Coast where it's you know, optimistic, dreamy, and, and idealistic. But on the East Coast, <laughs> we're, we're, in the, we're in the trenches, man. We're fighting with the worst enemies you can possibly imagine, the ones who want to do you harm. In other words, I, had, I talked to a Canadian inventor, uh, an investor, 
And he says, you mean to tell me the government, if they knew something was good for you, they wouldn't do it? And he says, yeah, it happens every day. Are you kidding? <laughs> and it's the strong lobbying efforts of the American Petroleum Institute who come and steal files right from the DOE under threat of lawsuits. That just happened six months ago. But you don't hear it never makes the news because the insiders squirm and, and cry and complain, but you know, they keep it quiet. And the DOE reports the same way. And what we're trying to do now from the inside is to preserve that report, get it leaked to the public before it gets sanitized. Because that's what's happened to many things, including, of course, our next speaker will tell you how many things have been sanitized for public uh, con uh, consumption. So, um, so we can develop electricity. And the nice thing, Paul, you know, even the company that's being run now after Paul was murdered um, it pr doesn't believe that you can put one megawatt in and get 20 out. That, this was Paul's dream, that not only do you transmute the waste, but you also get electricity as well. So, um, so we're, we're at the stage now where we're going to start to see some of this. And um, as you burn up fuel, you actually um, do some good. <clears throat> now, talking about nuclear stuff, I've got to give a little bit of credit to fusion. And fusion, of course, also has a very bad rap. I'm not even talking about cold fusion. I'm just talking about regular hot fusion. Um, the hot fusion area essentially is looking for, as this is Paul Werbos' slide, um, things like inherent uh, neutron safety, um, possibility of clean, you know, non-radioactive fusion, and of course the regulations that tend to stop a lot of this. All of these are inputs to what we want as a major innovation. And we have a society demand for clean energy, of course. <clears throat> But the uh, important part is that fusion needs to look at um, less massive materials and presumably and preferably radioactivity free. And this is uh, Dr. Werbos' um, summary of what he talked about in his talk. Now what Werbos pointed out, as many of the nuclear experts have, is that proton boron fusion is the one that no one has tried yet. Actually, there's about a dozen scientists in the world who have tried it. The one problem is you need to reach a billion degrees, and Focus Fusion has done that. But the interesting thing is, and this is uh, directly from the, the DOE, recently when the tokamak was challenged by Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Hirsch was the father of fusion. Back in the 70s, he actually brought the fusion tokamak from England over here, got um, Brookhaven, MIT, or whatever, to start building it. His report says the tokamak will never work. Uh, do you know what a tokamak is? Not too many people might know. It's basically a donut. It's just a, a round donut, just like your favorite Krispy Kreme donuts. And, but it's a toroid. Essentially, it's a, a coil of, of magnetic energy, electrical creating magnetic energy in a circle. And these toroids are the basics, basis of tokamaks. Tokamaks have billion dollar funding. And when you have an established institution that's called institutionalized, it's really hard to dislodge that, even if you got something better, which is exactly what proton boron fusion does. So the nice thing about proton boron is that there's no radioactivity. Hello, I just said something amazing about fusion. <laughs> this means you don't have to deal with nuclear waste and you don't have to deal with hot neutrons bombarding you and everybody else around. So what Eric Lerner has produced, and we're actually advocating, we're doing as much advocacy for Eric Lerner as possible, um, he's achieved a billion degree threshold, and he's measured it three different ways. He found that Los Alamos threatened his collaborators, which were university professors. Um, they, they went to the extreme of also threatening them and warning them not to compare it with the tokamak, Oh, when I mentioned Dr. Hirsch, well, Dr. Hirsch faced the same thing. He wrote a, a RAND Corporation financed report that the DOE got the RAND Corporation to do, got approval from RAND for the assessment that the tokamak will never produce commercial electricity, even 25 years from now, which they always say 25 years later, 25 years later. And, um, and what did he get? He got fired for that. And the DOE is writing, rewriting the report. That's what they do on the East Coast. They don't like the results, they rewrite it. Scientists have the lowest rung on the ladder as far as getting to the public. 
So it's, it's, that's why there's a scientific integrity movement. I invite you all to go to the Union of Concerned Scientists website and sign up for their petition on scientific integrity. Because we need the scientists to at least support, report the facts. This is very important. And of course, here's all the facts. The facts are this is a garage size invention. Um, Eric's already built a couple of these. He's now at the point where he's surpassing break even. I have just a few business plans um, on the desk if you want a hard copy. We have a free copy on our website you can download. And it shows the graph approaching break even. In other words, the very next experiment, he's going to pass break even. It's not like Tokamak where it's never going to get to break even, you know. This one actually has been funded by NASA as well. And NASA has done the same thing the DOE did. They said, this can be a form of space propulsion. Because what do you get out? Highly charged particles. That's it. Charged particles you can induct to electricity directly. And, um, and that they still won't acknowledge that Eric achieved their um, goal, which was the uh, billion degree threshold. And there's a website, focusfusion.org. So he's been su uh, suffering from suppression, as most of the inventors will. I need to point out that this is a modus operandi of inventorship. Um, if anyone knows the um, structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, that's really our roadmap. That's our Bible. Uh, you, you read that book, any part of the book, and you find that the history of scientific innovation has constantly been faced with the same resistance. Einstein even pointed that out, too. But the, the way you recognize it is that the first time you propose the innovation, like I did at the State Department, you get shut down with all the heavy battle um, armament they can throw at you because they treat you as an anomaly. That's what Dr. Kuhn says. The, the first time it's treated as anomaly and dismissed. The second time you come around with even more evidence in a bigger you know, uh, tank or whatever, um, then they still fight you, but the resistance is lower, and they're still demanding a theory. In other words, they're sort of you know, without uh, grounding. You're, you're putting them in, you're pushing them into the quicksand area, and they want to get back on, on firm foundation. And classical physics offers a firm foundation. So we need to develop theories really quick, at least to help some of the people that are fighting us. Or else you just wait till they die off, and then you get the young people in there, and, and, um, and that's how Einstein said the really scientific revolutions happen. So let me go on to my uh, second topic, and that is the, uh, or third topic, the fabulous world of zero-point energy. We have a feasibility study that I'll uh, briefly summarize. Um, how many people know what zero-point energy is? Hey, we've got a great crowd here. Excellent. <laughs> Good. I won't have to talk for another half hour just to explain it. Um, first of all, notice that the density is debatable. We're looking at 200 ergs per cc in the optical region, which is small but significant. Most people who have looked at zero-point energy dismiss it, um, saying that it's too tiny. It's literally supposed to be a half of an H Planck's constant times the frequency. Um, and yet, when you look at the um, facts of the figures, the virtual particle is doing all kinds of dancing to show you how you can transmute it or transduce it. But most of us don't really look at all the, uh, the signs and bells and whistles. So first of all, this is probably the most famous experiment, is where you basically have casimir forces um, pushing plates together, which when you get to a micron size spacing, you actually have very good agreement between experiment and, and theory. And it turns out that about 17 millivolts of charge on both plates will tend to balance that casimir force that's pushing it together. So uh, there's been many scientists uh, who have proposed methods to, uh, to use electricity and virtual particles in sort of a give-and-take, push-pull system. Notice this drawing, if you can uh, see the detail of it. This is an artist's rendering of what an electron looks like. Isn't that kind of strange? It's really what they call a dressed electron. It polarizes the vacuum. In other words, the vacuum tries to produce all the positive charges it can to neutralize the huge electron gradient that's happening at around 10 to the minus 15 meters, you know, when you get down to the femtosphere size. And, um, and of course, the vacuum can't do it, but it's breaking down. It's producing lots of energy. So the electron gradient is a very important part. 
NASA, of course, also has acknowledged this on their website. And they point out uh, lots of big numbers to entice you as far as how much energy is talk we're talking about. And, um, and so I decided to do this for my PhD thesis. Um, at the uh, master's level, I was interested in the homopolar generator. And so I was lucky enough to do that for a project too. And so I've been looking at free energy projects as I advanced my uh, academic career. <clears throat> And now I'm looking forward to getting the journal articles out there to really um, advance the uh, state of affairs as well. And of course, there's various websites you can go to. Um, I think I might have just wiped this one out. Looks like on this slide too. It's earthtech.org. But um, there's a few other websites uh, as well that are available, uh, including ours. This whole feasibility study, if you just go to our website, integrityresearchinstitute.org, you can download the whole 180 pages in Microsoft Word, at least for the next month or so. We, we tried to basically give it away in the initial stage so that everyone at least gets a sample of it. And then uh, the book will actually be out as a uh, eight and a half by 11 bound book. And that'll be on Amazon integrityresearchinstitute.org. You can download the free copy of the Focus Fusion business plan as well as the feasibility of the quantum uh, vacuum extraction of uh, energy. This is a feasibility study done on the most rigorous scale possible so that you have lots of good description but also lots of equations. And so I'm looking forward to producing um, a, a basic uh, layman's book called Zero Point Energy Fuel of the Future uh, that will probably be out next year. And to emphasize the fact that zero point energy is, is really everywhere, I showed you the picture of the electron. Well, there's lots of ways you can use zero point energy. And that's another whole talk, by the way, which actually is out there on, on DVD, which was at the Tesla Tech Conference. But the important uh, highlights I can point out is that temperature, magnetic fields, um, dielectric constants, uh, even light, will change the parameters to even affecting the Casimir force. In other words, the Casimir force, as you saw, is, is an attractive force. Well, you can actually produce a repelling force by just a change of temperature. And that's exactly what the universe is experiencing as it accelerates apart. Um, and so zero-point energy really has a, a fundamental basis on, on the electron, on the atom, uh, on inertia, um, on gravity. Put off is really credited for advancing this field tremendously. And we now have, I would say, a roadmap to seeing how many of these technologies will be developed, including, for example, electron charge cluster technology. When you start to get electrons touching each other, which in cl charge clusters you do, you're actually seeing the Casimir force overcome the basic repelling force of the electrons themselves. And that's what Ken Shoulders has uh, brilliantly showed us in all of his wonderful experiments, including this one um, that essentially does things that no other um, process can achieve, and that is putting holes in things that are uh, impenetrable sometimes. And so the energy is tremendous. He's patented uh, a couple different um, patents that show the um, energy output exceeds the energy input. And whenever you have electron discharge like this, uh, we found that there's that continuing pattern, that electric arc discharge oftentimes and most of the time will exceed the input energy. And I'll show you some more examples as well. So in terms of um, the uh, charge clusters, we foresee, I foresee, for example, the same process that um, Eric Lerner is using for his focus fusion. You get a strong single beam of charged particles. All you do is you put toroids around them. That's where the tokamak should be used. Just put the toroid there, sitting there by itself, unenergized, and wait till the charges go through it. What you get is a very fast, huge spike of magnetic energy. And of course, the toroid itself then produces electricity. And you therefore damp out, you slow down the electric charge until it stops virtually with no energy. Uh, so it's a very nice transduction method. Uh, it's inductive coupling, in other words. And here's another great example. In fact, this one I feel is a pioneering um, breakthrough. I even called uh, one of the authors here, George Hathaway. And of course, um, um, Peter Grinot was one of our speakers at the Conference on Future Energy. We also have the proceedings out on the desk. The fascinating part about this is that 
you see the cracks in the establishment. Remember I told you about the structure of uh, scientific revolutions? Well, 10 years ago, 20 years ago especially, there was paranoia, there was all kinds of suppression, and of course it still happens, but the fact that you can actually publish in a peer-reviewed journal the output exceeding the input, <laughs> there, there's a break in the, there's a crack in the foundation here. And, and so the walls are starting to crumble. And as more and more of these experiments start to get published in journals, the experts have to start to become silent. And they have to start asking us for the information that they've overlooked and they've never assembled. And this is one of them. All you do is you explode from a high voltage capacitor that literally is about six feet tall. I've seen them. And it goes through something very much like a piston with a, with a heavy brass or steel uh, weight piston sitting in a very heavy metallic um, cavity, a cylinder. And what, just like your car, the piston sits there waiting for an explosion. Well, the explosion is simply electrical discharge, and there's the plume that normally wants to shoot out if you don't have a piston. Well, in this case, the piston, uh, to measure the kinetic energy, is shot up into the air. And so you just measure the potential energy. And that's how he found, very simply using classical physics, that the potential energy out exceeded the electrical energy in. And so the electrons, you have to admit, are getting energy from somewhere. Where else than the zero-point energy field, the quantum vacuum? And so what they're pointing out is probably a little bit of a challenge, and that is, how do you deal with high-speed plumes, 1,000 meters per second, except for maybe a Mazda engine-style, high rotational speed uh, transducer? Because as you try to slow this process down, it produces less and less energy. And from my point of view, if you're literally only looking at about 150% average efficiency, it's not enough to really get too excited about. But in terms of over unity, at least we broke the barrier. And this is one of his uh, slides showing the actual numbers. Input energy, about 40 joules. Output energy, about 29 in kinetic. And then, of course, you got the heat, another 30. So if you had 30 plus 30, you got about 60, and you only put in about 40 joules. So there's your 150% output. Very systematically measured, repeatedly peer, uh, published in peer-reviewed journal. Um, so over unity needs to be recognized as, as a phenomena that now is appearing in many different experiments. And, uh, and we're actually very excited that you're going to see more and more of this. Because this is our future. We're not supposed to keep burning fossil fuels the rest of our existence. We won't survive if we do. So here is an actual example <clears throat> of the little engine of the future. And once again, I, I am happy to point out that this was published in Physical Review. And in Physical Review, the abstract read, and this is Dr. Pinto's words, actually. If you go PhysRev B, uh, volume 60, 1999, page 44 or 57, you'll find the abstract says, free energy. <laughs> I was so elated. I mean, I, I, I thought we'd only see it in movies once in a while, like uh, Chain Reaction, you know, complaining about free energy and how disruptive that would be. Well, he's putting in a physical review now, too, that if this is true, and all of his arguments point out that it is, um, we're, we're going to have free energy coming out of it. So the uh, description here, basically, and this is just a little summary to give you a, a taste of what we're talking about here, Casimir forces being put together um, the remarkable trick of using micro lasers that are only two microns in size on a 50 to 100 micron box. Nanotechnology is perfectly capable of doing this. Um, the dielectric constant changes instantly, and all of a sudden you get a huge improvement in the Casimir force, and of course the electron transfer happens as well. So what he points out in the, and this is a quote from the uh, feasibility study, is that some concerns are usually raised, um, as mentioned previously, as to whether the vacuum energy is conserved. In quantum systems, if the parameters or boundary conditions are held constant, the Casimir force is strictly conservative in the classical sense, according to Pinto. Quote, when they are changed, however, it is possible to identify closed paths along which the total work done by this force does not vanish. 
In other words, you get negative workout or free energy. <laughs> And that's exactly what he's proposing. And what's exciting to me is I'm seeing PhysRev, Nature, and Science, all with these wonderful articles where the scientists struggle with, is energy conserved? Oh, it looks like a perpetual motion machine. They actually use perpetual mobile. That phrase gets repeated, saying it appears that it might be a perpetual mobile. But of course, we know better than that. You can't violate the second law of thermodynamics. And then you just leave it. You know, they keep going. So that's great. Why worry about the laws? Because the laws are meant to be broken anyways. <laughs> you should know that in, in Oregon, right? <laughs> enough said on that topic. OK, so back to the power at hand here. Um, 0.5 nanowatts is what we're talking about. And if you have thousands of these, you can look at, um, it turns out to be around a kilowatt per meter squared. So a meter squared is going to give you a kilowatt continually. And of course, you have all of the um, substances and the 10,000 um, uh, cycle per second um, cycle time as well. Now, moving ahead, and this gives you just a sample of my zero point energy talk, the other fascinating, and I would say the conclusion of the whole feasibility study, is that these are probably the best ones to look at. Solid state diodes. And the special metal to metal diodes are the ones that basically, like um, the metal to metal diode up at the top here, 3890161, is a wonderful example of putting diodes in an array, having all the diodes working on non thermal energy. See, so th when you get into any region like room temperature, you're going to have thermal and non thermal jittering of all the particles in the substance. And so the diode can transduce uh, and rectify all of that electricity so it goes in one direction. And that's what these diode circuits are designed to do. So, so we actually feel, and I feel, that the conclusion of our feasibility study shows lots of various ways, like I just showed you, complex nanotech or simple nanotech. I'll go for the simple nanotech. You know? and, and now we're finding out, even though this may not be the best uh, molecular diode to use, it shows you nanotech is down to the molecular size already. And if you put one particular um, uh, excit exciton on the top, you end up with a current direction going upwards. And if you put another molecule there, you get a current direction downwards. So lots of various um, um, parameters can be varied to achieve your goal. So, uh, so leaving that as a very vital area of research, I feel that there are scientists around the world already researching these solid state diodes just to transduce the quantum fluctuations that are constantly going on, which now can produce energy consistently. In other words, our future basically is a vision of a black box sitting in your house, producing all your heat, all your electricity, and uh, even powering your you know, microwave or whatever. And, uh, and of course, you use your to utility um, transmission line just as backup. Now, <clears throat> giving credit to put off for at least proposing the theory as the basis of inertia and gravity being intimately connected to the zero point field. In other words, as you go down the street and you're making a left turn, your body gets pushed to the right. That's inertia. We blame Newton for that. But as it turns out, put off points out, the zero point field is reacting electromagnetically to your body. Your body's filled with charges, your car's filled with charges, and it resists the change in motion because it's moving through an electromagnetic medium. And this is exactly what this scientist, uh, Dr. Fiegel, points out. Uh, the first physicist to use zero point energy to satisfy energy conservation. See, I pointed out that when you deal with a huge bath, an open system like zero point energy, the experts basically say that the parameters change, therefore it's not conserved. Well, there's another nice argument that's very satisfying to the classical.